Can I invite uh, Rachel to uh, talk us through plant protection products, please? Good morning, everybody. So I'm Rachel Brown. Um, I'm part of the Chemicals Transition Programme and I'm leading on the um, plant protection product side. I only have a few slides for you this morning just to go through, um, as I wanted to give you all the chance to ask more questions, um, as Matt was saying earlier, and really understand the details that, that matter to you. So I'll have a few slides now to um, give us a reminder of some of the key points that we've talked about before and that we've published information on before, but also to address some of the more recent questions we've been answering through the inquiry line. Um, and then it'll be over to you to the questions that, that you're putting through on, onto the website. Okay, uh, can we have the next slide, please? So the first quick update I'm going to do is regarding active substances. Um, we've spoken previously that the expiry date of active substances, which were due to expire in the first three years after the end of the transition period, they've all been now extended for a further three years. And this was set out in our legislation um, that all kicked in at the, at the end of the transition period. So information on the submission of application for renewal of, of these active substances has now been published and there's information available on our website. Um, and I'll cover that in a little bit more detail in, in some of the questions. But applications are required three years before the expiry date of those active substances. As we've said earlier, though, decisions on renewal may be taken earlier. Um, particularly if we've got any concerns about the active substances and, and that three-year extension. We've, we've talked previously about Mancazeb. Um, obviously, that's a non-renewal decision that's been taken in the EU and took effect from, from the 4th of January, and that will apply in Northern Ireland. Um, however, this legislation would allow us to extend the active substance for, for three years in GB. However, given the concerns, um, we will be prioritising that review of Mancazeb ahead of that three-year extension. Can the next slide, please? So moving on to a quick update on pesticide products and, and some of the issues that have, have been raised recently. Um, GB does continue to accept applications supported by other jurisdictions, uh, assessments from other jurisdictions. We will be making our own independent GB assessment but you are able to provide that information to us um, where it's appropriate if, if, if decisions have been made elsewhere. One issue that's been raised recently um, is how to progress with, with following zonal applications or, or similar applications that, that would have relied on other assessments. And again, this has been explained on our website in the communications that we've published. But any following zonal applications currently waiting to be considered by HSE where the Zonal Rapporteur Member State has yet to conclude its evaluation, these will need to be converted to GB only Article 33 applications. And you can support your application by one of a number of methods. You could provide the registration report to us once it's been finalised in the Zonal Rapporteur Member State, and then we can process the application using the information. But obviously, the Part C wouldn't be available to us due to the confidential aspects contained within that. Um, you could request that Great Britain undertakes a full evaluation of Article 33. Um, this would provide provision of, uh, the provision of further data to support the application, though. Um, we will provide some more guidance on um, the submission and the fees charged um, for that kind of route. If you have any questions about that or questions about applications that you wish us to consider down that route, please get in touch with the inquiries line um, and raise specific questions about specific applications. Um, you could also submit a new Article 33 application without any supporting information from other member states. But again, this would require the provision of further data and any new guidance and templates would apply to a new application. As I said, do get in touch with the applicant, applicant helpline um, if you wish to discuss how to proceed with any specific application if you're not sure. Um, another issue that's been raised um, recently is applications for technical equivalence. Um, so I wanted to, to cover that. We can process technical equivalence applications in GB, but this will now require um, a full assessment in GB. Um, this is because we no longer have access to the confidential information um, required to support um, a mutual recognition or, or reduced fee technical equivalence. 
we wouldn't have the information from the other member state anymore. This would be considered confidential and wouldn't be supplied to us. So for GB, um, any technical equivalences will need to be um, a full assessment and, and all the necessary data and information provided to us. Um, it's a little bit complicated on the technical equivalent side because of course for NI, um, NI and GB aren't considered to be member states obviously and therefore can't be involved in the assessment of active substances. And therefore for NI, um, GB cannot assess a technical equivalence of an active substance. So to have an active substance technical equivalence added to an NI authorisation, um, we would need to request the information um, from, from the member states concerned for that for NI, and we would be entitled to access that information for that purpose, but for that purpose only. So those are some, some complicated products um, issues that have been risen recently. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So maximum residue levels, a few, few confirmatory pieces of information. Um, all EU MRLs that were applicable prior to the 1st of January 2021, they all became GB MRLs and they will remain valid until they're specifically changed by any decisions taken for GB. And they're outlined in our GB MRL statutory register. For NI, the EU MRLs apply and any changes to EU MRLs can only be undertaken on the basis of an application submitted to and then assessed and taken forward by one of the EU member states. Divergence in EU and GB MRLs will occur and it's important to check the target markets. Divergence in MRLs, particularly as a result of the ongoing EU MRL review programme, may affect PP authorisations for NI. It's important to note that data supporting authorisations in I will be taken into account by the EU during the MRL review process. Information on new MRL processes are outlined on the HSE website, um, so I do refer to that source. This includes how to apply for a new MRL, uh, a new import tolerance, or the submission of outstanding MRL confirmatory data. Um, the specific MRL application form for GB now and specific templates um, which you can find on our website. There will be a formal review programme for GB um, which will be implemented within, within the next three years but prior to this MRLs will be reviewed as and when required um, for example to protect public health. Um, this will be established along with the active renewals programme but there will be no scheduled MRLs reviews Reactive reviews will be instigated at any point if any information comes to light which indicates that there are any risks to consumers. Okay, next slide please. So just looking at the Northern Ireland Protocol and the UK Internal Market Bill. So as with the withdrawal agreement and the NI Protocol, um, EU regulations and MRLs continue to apply directly in Northern Ireland. So the position there remains very much as it was during the transition period. Uh, new decisions on active substances and MRLs taken under the EU regime continue to apply directly in Northern Ireland, but decisions taken under any GB regimes will not. So the government is committed to unfettered access for qualifying Northern Ireland goods moving to the rest of the UK market and the UK Internal Market Bill 2020 enshrines sort of in primary legislation that qualifying Northern Ireland goods benefit from this principle of mutual recognition. Uh, it enables goods to continue to be placed on the whole of the UK market, even where the Northern Ireland Protocol applies different rules to Northern Ireland. Um, mutual recognition allows that a good that meets the relevant regulatory requirements relating to sale in the part of the UK it's produced in or imported into to be sold elsewhere in other parts of the UK. This applies to rules on maximum residue levels, the MRLs, in the same way it applies to rules on goods generally. It's to ensure effective fun functioning of the internal market. Mutual recognition principles have not been applied to active substance approvals though or PPP authorisations. And the administrations, the devolved administrations, retain the power to decide which pesticides can be used in their own territories, as they've always been able to do so. 
UKIM means that treated produce from Northern Ireland, produced in accordance with the EU MRLs, can be placed on the market in GB, even if the GB and EU MRLs diverge. So as long as it's a qualifying Northern Ireland good, that is okay. The def definition of a qualifying good is set out in the legislation, and in broad terms, it means that those goods in free circulation in Northern Ireland is what it means. We're going to bring forward a longer term qualifying regime in the course of 2021, with only businesses established in Northern Ireland better benefiting from unfettered access. And detail on that regime will be published in due course. There's a lot more further guidance on Northern Ireland qualifying goods available on www.gov.uk. There's a caveat um, that rules continue to apply directly in Northern Ireland. So treated produce can only be placed on the market in the Northern Ireland in accordance with the EU regulations that apply there. In practice, all the devolved administrations delegate their pesticide regulatory functions to us in HSE to undertake on their behalf. And this helps us to ensure a consistent approach. And we've got structures in place to work closely together and to make sure that we can take joint decisions where possible and appropriate. Okay, next slide, please. So just some actions um, for people and businesses. Um, if you're a pesticide manufacturer or authorization holder, um, just a reminder, current authorizations and approvals remain in place, but you should consider where you wish to make your new pesticide applications in future. So you now need to make new applications under both the GB and EU regimes to gain access to both GB and Northern Ireland markets. For PPP wholesalers, distributors, traders, just to be aware that over time, there could be divergence in the products which are authorised in GB and NI, and this might affect businesses which move products between GB and NI. If you're a pesticide user or agronomist, there's no immediate change to the products that are authorised. In the short term, continue to use authorised products and always follow the label, as we always have. But over time, there may be some extra things to think about. If treated produce is intended for export, for example, to the EU, you need to make sure that you understand the requirements for treated produce in that target market, as this might affect which pesticides you choose to use. If your business trades in food produce, um, you should be aware that maximum residue levels in Great Britain and NI may start to diverge over time. You might need to think about the requirements in your target market. Again, if goods are to be exported, you're going to have to specify those requirements to suppliers and to ensure that you meet MRLs in, in all locations. Okay, next slide please. That was my, my update um, on, on issues that have been ongoing. And I think we're going to look at some some recent questions that have uh, have come in. Brilliant. Th thanks, Rachel. And thanks for keeping that. I think you know targeting on what um, you know the key updates and what mm -hmm. certainly what businesses and um, uh, colleagues need to do is, is great. But you're right. We've just we've just got a handful from the last few days. But then we will be using uh, the, the questions uh, that have been submitted during the course of the, the session this morning. So let's just look at a couple of these on the on, on this first slide, uh, Rachel. So so this is obviously about uh, um, HC website outlines that the applicant must support the renewal of active substances. So what are the requirements for the applicant to support the renewal of an active substance? And also the important question, what are the associated fees? <laughs> so um, to support renewal of approval in Great Britain beyond the expiry date, whether that's an extended expiry date or, or an existing one, um, we require an application to confirm that the renewal of the active substance is being supported in GB. And this must be submitted three years before the approval expires in GB. Um, any applications that you are submitting to us uh, should include a covering letter stating your intention to support renewal of the approval in GB. Um, if you've submitted renewal to the EU already or about to, you could submit as a copy of the application for renewal to EU. That will also be accepted by us. And even if you it may have previously been submitted to us in another guise, you should include that again if it's available. If you're not applying for renewal in the EU, but you want to support the active in GB, this will require a GB application um, and the format will be as per the EU application. 
if any um, if the EU representative use or uses aren't relevant to GB, the covering letter should indicate details of representative GB use or uses that you intend to support. At this initial stage, no study reports or supporting data are required. A full supporting data will, uh, dossier will be required later in the renewals process. So at the first stage, it will just be the initial application fee, the SIF fee of, of 229 will be charged when you confirm that you want to support renewal of the active substance. A full evaluation fee will be charged when the full dossier is submitted, but the fees and charges will vary at that point depending on the amount of data submitted and the evaluation required by HSE. Okay, well, that's that's a really comprehensive answer. Thank you, Rachel. I think what that what that demonstrates, doesn't it, is obviously the person that's asked the question has has had a look at our website, and I think obviously the the detail that you give behind that that's an opportunity for us to revisit what we're saying on our website and making sure that we we get into that level of detail that that you've set out there so that uh, people can really understand. So thank you for that that, that detail. And we'll certainly look to how reflect that back in the website and our guidance as to how we can answer questions like that. So the second question on the slide in front of us now. Uh, Rachel is is about product authorization. So again, it's about its expiry date. So they remain valid. I think you said that in your presentation until their expiry date under the GB regime. But if the active, if the subs, active substance is due to be re renewed, uh, when does the product renewal need to be submitted by both in GB and then obviously separately? What what's the situation in Northern Ireland? So the regulations don't change on this. There's no change to the requirements for the renewal of products under Article Forty Three of oh, 11 of 7, 2009. So once the active substance has been renewed in Great Britain, then the applications for the renewal of the products must be made within the usual three months of the renewal of the approval of the active substance. So that's a normal procedure. Once the substance has been renewed, the Article 43 applications will follow for GB. So no change there. Under the withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol, the EU legislation continues to apply in Northern Ireland. So this may mean that renewal dates are different or that there may even be different um, conditions required as part of that renewal. But any renewal for products in Northern Ireland, again, will be subject to the usual requirements under Article 43. And once the active substance has been renewed in Europe, um, within three months, we'll need to have an indication that those, those products will also be being renewed. Brilliant. Okay. Could you have the next slide, please? There's a couple more questions on, on here just to be prepared earlier and then we'll move on. So first question, uh, number four there, uh, Rachel, is uh, risk assessments. What risk assessments should be provided uh, in Northern Ireland, um, central EU or UK? So the, again, this is kind of unchanged, really. So mm -hmm. any applications specifically for NI would need to be supported with the same level of information that we previously required for a UK assessment. So that would include meeting any central zone requirements and any UK specific requirements that we had previously, they would still need to be met. So it'd be unchanged. I think that's a key message, isn't it, throughout is the Northern Ireland is essentially mm -hmm. uh, uh, unchanged for, for the purposes of, of PPPs. Thank you, Rachel. And the final one just on the screen um, is, is if a registration is granted in GB, does mutual recognition work from GB to Northern Ireland? And if so, what does the implication for risk assessments? So no, um, mutual recognition doesn't work um, between GB and NI. However, um, we can look at some um, common assessments and common ways of handling the application. So if there's no divergence in the GB and NI regimes, it may be possible for us to carry out GB and NI assessments together. So this could result in a common authorization. Currently, there's little divergence between the regimes and unless divergence affects an application directly, for example, the re-registration of an active substance that we've already talked about, then common applications could be made and could be processed by HSE. If there's divergence um, between the regimes, separate applications um, may be required, resulting separate authorizations being issued as well. Um, it may be possible for us to treat some parts of the assessment as common to both applications though when we're looking at it. As I talked about earlier, though, the one exception there is really in, in the technical equivalence of active substances, um, because if we assess um, a technical equivalence of active substance for GB, that couldn't um, be used to support application in NI because we're just not allowed um, to be involved in, in the assessment of active substances in that way. 
Great. Okay. So if um, if class, if you have the next slide, please. And that um, what we're going to now move to is is to look at some of the questions that have been um, just submitted today during the session, either during Rachel's session or just before. And this this puts Rachel on the spot a little bit because she might have not have any uh, notice of these, but I'm sure uh, we've got all confidence that. Um, that, that it'll be fine. So, so again, if you want to ask any more questions, please keep submitting them. But I'm just going to pick one. Um, well, it links to, to, to expiry dates, and it's well, it's on Mankazeb, uh, Rachel. And this question is from uh, Gary Gary Bradbury, uh, Gary Bradbury Consultancy. Um, and um, we meant, you mentioned the Mankazeb in in your presentation, but I think the specific question is about plans for last use dates for which actives are no longer authorised. Uh, will we be looking to use similar EU dates, or will we be looking to modify? Um, and what are the implications for last use space for uh, no substances which are no longer authorised? Okay, so last use states, um, to explain that, there's, there's quite a, a number of elements there, really. So last use for actives which are no longer authorised um, will be published on individual product authorisations um, and we'll, we'll, we'll publish notices to, to if existing dates are to change. And the dates will depend on the relevant legislation. Um, it might depend also whether the active substance has been unsupported or if a non-renewal decision has been taken. Um, the, the source of why the active is no longer authorised may be relevant. So as a bit of background, I suppose, um, when we issue a product authorisation, we usually give the maximum expiry dates for products. And that's based on the duration and the grace period articles um, specified in, in 1107. So products are usually given three dates, um, and the first date is determined according to Article 32 duration, which states that an authorisation, um, the words, it, it can be set out for a period not exceeding one year for the date of the active, uh, expiry of the active substance. And then after that, we apply what we call a grace period, and that allows us to grant a further six months um, for sale and distribution and an additional one year for disposal, storage and use of stocks. So that's our standard um, withdrawal period that we always apply. So that extra date, that extra year that we add um, in the first instance, um, according to the um, Article uh, 32 for duration, is only relevant if approval, um, if active substances are supported at renewal. So if active substances aren't supported, all the products effectively lose that date. So in terms of what dates would we use, if an active substance was no longer supported, the expiry date of the products would be the expiry date of the active substance plus an additional six months for sale and an additional 12 months for storage and use, according to um, the grace period. However, if an active substance is non-renewed, and there are causes for concern about that active substance, then the withdrawal dates for those products may be shorter. Because that grace period, it's not a guaranteed grace period, it should never be seen as um, that will be applied in all cases. That is the maximum that we will apply. So if a non-renewal decision is taken, um, and there's, there's concerns about the substance, the grace period may be reduced. Um, we've seen seen some grace periods um, in the EU issued to a matter of just a couple of months um, in the past, depending on, on what the situation is with that active substance. So in terms of what, what, it, what would be the last use date, I would say it depends on the withdrawal conditions um, and why it's been, why that uh, active has come to an end. In terms of Mancazeb, um, that's been raised specifically because obviously um, it's been withdrawn in the EU and there will be last dates being published for the products for Northern Ireland um, quite shortly. Uh, the Commission has published in its regulation um, the dates that should be applied to Mancazet. However, um, we will consider those dates and um, consider whether they're appropriate, as we always have done in the past for applying uh, withdrawal dates in the UK previously. We will still follow that format to, to ensure that we're we're happy with those because again we we could shorten that period if, if we felt it absolutely necessary um so the northern ireland dates for last use will be published shortly um as i mentioned in the, the presentation in terms of um in gb the products currently have the expiry date of the active plus the year for duration plus the six plus 12 grace period um 
and they're, they're unchanged at the moment. But as we will um, intend to look at this active quite closely, it is likely that you know they, they could be shortened if we, if we take a decision to do so. Okay. So in terms of last use days, it depends. It depends why why there is a, a shortening of, of the use, how short it could be. Okay. Great, and we're getting quite a lot of new questions coming through now, so I'm sure you're going to be quite busy in the, in the breakout, <laughs> breakout room uh, later. And I think there's there's a question I think following on from that from well, I think I can answer that Bridan uh, Griffin uh, from Life Scientific, but I mean, will CRD's website list the new active expiry dates following the three year extension? I think we can, you know, unless you advise me otherwise, Rachel will be able to say will we say yes or will we be able to get that information out? I think it already um, does. Yeah, it does. okay. I, yeah. I think there's now a GB active substance register, and that has a new date. Okay, great. Okay, let's just see what we can um, uh, fit in. So, um, a question from uh, uh, Fabienne uh, Jean Rendu from uh, Rifcon uh, GM uh, Rifcon. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Fabienne. There's a couple couple here. Um, one on products, one on uh, substances. So, for a dossier for a PPP products dossier, should the UK registration dossier reflect the complete central zone dossier, um, including all gap and explanations? And then on the active substance. Will the UK stick with the EU uh, e regulations in the near future, or are there any national deviations foreseen? So I think you touched on that in your presentation, Rachel, around sort of divergence. But do you want to sort of take those yeah. two from from Fabian? So um, I think the the first question is similar to the one um, that we mm. had on the slide about Northern Ireland. Mm. So so the dossier should reflect um, the complete dossier if it's available, but obviously it will still need to be adapted um, for GB. So any GB gap or UK specific data requirements will need to be met. Um, unchanged really as it as, as it always has been um, and the second question um, the GB re, re, uh, the, the, the GB legislation uh, reflects EU regulations um, from day one at the moment um, there's, there's no change in, in the regulations there and so for at least the near future that's likely to remain the same there will be I'm sure deviation deviation in future divergence um, as we progress and, and think of things that may be more GB specific, um, and, and we may take independent decisions. But but for now, um, it's a consistent approach. Brilliant. Okay, let's try and squeeze one more in before before the break. And I'm just going to turn to uh, the question from uh, Keith McQuillan from Life Sciences, Life Scientific Limited. Um, and there's one about the analysis. So will um, will CID recognise active substance source evaluations, particularly five batch analysis performed by other member states prior to 31st of December? That's the first. Um, so we won't recognise evaluations as such. Uh, mutual recognition um, isn't part of the our regulation anymore. But we can consider assessments performed by other member states when we're undertaking an assessment for GB. It will be an independent GB conclusion. Um, but we can consider any information that's provided to us. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to note. I think Richard talked about it in his introduction as well. This doesn't mean that we'll be working in complete isolation, mm. does it? We'll be uh, looking to see what scientific analysis has been done both in the EU and elsewhere as well. Um, and then maybe you can start on the conversation on the next part of Keith's question, uh, Rachel, and maybe I can come in. But um, do we still have access to uh, uh, some of the uh, the EU systems? Uh, I think it's in particular in, in uh, relation to, to Northern Ireland. So do you want to give that an yeah. icon? So um, we are working on access to enable us to carry out the functions that we need to carry out under the withdrawal um, agreement. Our access to EU regulatory information um, that isn't publicly available will solely be to grant us as competent authority um, to enable us to carry out those tasks um, required by the withdrawal agreement. Any information that we do get through this route for Northern Ireland, it mustn't be used for any other purpose other than ensuring the application of the regulations as required by the protocol. So if we need access to the information to support an application for Northern Ireland, we'll be able to request that information from the EU, um, but it will only be in respect of Northern Ireland. We'll be unable to use it for other purposes. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really helpful. And just, uh, just to bring it to a conclusion, I think, I think Richard mentioned in his in his opening, we've as well as the uh, trade and cooperation agreement, the final details of the Northern Ireland protocol, the operation of that um, were concluded just before Christmas as well. 
and with that comes the opportunity, as Rachel said, for us to uh, engage uh, with the Commission, uh, both Commission officials, both with EFSA officials and, and ECA officials as well, to talk about accessing data to support uh, Northern Ireland authorities across the different regimes. So that dialogue uh, is picking up pace um, and it's very, very pleasing for us to be able to, to have that dialogue, to be able to look at um, some of the uh, information that we need to support Northern Ireland.